we have a love-hate relationship with our weather forecasters. And I'm here to talk about how we're going to increase our trust in their forecasting capability by using data from tiny satellites. So every morning, we wake up, we grab our coffee, we turn on the news, and we listen to the weather forecast. It tells us what we're going to wear that day, it tells us kind of how our commute's going to go, and it tells us whether or not we're going to be able to go out for our sports activities after work, and it even lets us take a look at how our weekend's going to shape up. The accuracy of our weather forecast is only as good as the weather forecasting simulations and models. These are simulations of Earth's atmosphere, and they solve a series of meteorological equations that are only really solved when we put data into them. So we need observations from satellites, from planes, from on the ground, from balloons to solve these equations. And the more data we have in the right places at the right times lets us get better and more accurate forecasts. This is a hurricane track. It is from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. And we've all seen these before. This is of Dorian from August 2019. And what we're looking at here has a name. It's called the Cone of Uncertainty. And the Cone of Uncertainty is not the size of the hurricane as it grows. It's rather, where is it going to land? And you can imagine the difficulty that would face a government official looking at just this track, trying to figure out whether or not to order a mandatory evacuation, where to send supplies, and for an individual who may have a lot of resources and costs to think about, about whether or not to evacuate or to shelter in place. We really need to reduce these cones of uncertainty to improve the accuracy of our forecast, improve our reliability, and also improve our trust in our relationship with our weather forecaster. So I'm going to talk about how we can use tiny satellites like this one to do this. You're looking at it, it's not very big. It's only about as big as a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> and so here, from not this past summer, but the summer before, this is Lauren Alesky from CBS 12, who famously solved a Rubik's Cube live while doing the forecast. And I'm going to tell you how satellites the size of a Rubik's Cube are going to help us get better data and improve the accuracy of our forecasts. So I work at a lab at MIT where we've been working on tiny satellites like this. They're called CubeSats not after the Rubik's Cube, but because they're cube-shaped, for the past 10 years. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about why we need satellites this tiny, and a lot of them, to improve our weather forecasting. To do that, though, first I have to talk about the big satellites. I have to talk about the satellites that we currently have up there and what the challenges are. So this is NOAA-20. This is the state-of-the-art weather satellite. It is the newest in a generation from a family tree of very capable weather satellites, and it's got five instruments on board it. It's got cameras, like visible cameras, it's got infrared cameras, and it's got my personal favorite, and one that I'm going to talk a lot about today, because it has a high impact on the accuracy of our forecasts, one called a microwave radiometer. Now, don't worry, it doesn't emit microwave waves. It won't hurt any of us. It listens in the microwave for molecules in the atmosphere, and when they're at a certain temperature, they vibrate, the molecules do, and they vibrate at a very high frequency. And so it has antennas on board that listen for that vibration, and that vibration is related to the temperature that the air is at. So these types of instruments are really key in getting data for us. But these satellites are huge. They are the size of a very, very large SUV. You can see the man in the image that's working on the satellite for scale. These are very large, and unfortunately, they cost even more than a luxury SUV. <laughs> they cost about as much as it would cost if you live in a suburban town to get two SUVs for every household in your town. That's how much they cost. And some towns, that's sometimes enough to buy a house for everybody in the town. <laughs> but they're very expensive, um, and they're very sophisticated, and they're there to get this data for us reliably and accurately. So let's put this CubeSat on the scene and see how it sizes up compared to them. You can see that it's so much smaller, it's so much more compact. And the trick is going to be getting it so much smaller and so much more compact, much more cost effective. So it's only a few SUVs <laughs> instead of one for everyone in the town. 
So why do we need these and how are they going to help? What's the challenge that this big satellite faces? So in order to understand that, we have to look at how the satellite operates. So this is a movie of this NOAA-20, the big satellite, in orbit around the Earth. You can see how it's going around the Earth from north to south. And I'm going to unwrap this image into a map of the Earth. You can see where it's sunlight on one side and nighttime on the other. And the white lines are the orbit tracks as it goes around. So from looking at these orbit tracks, we can see what the coverage is on the Earth. And I'm letting this movie run for the course of one day. So over one day, we can see how much data we get from this one satellite. And we can see the problem right here. There are some really big gaps in the map from, this, from the data that we get from this satellite. The crosses are where we get two measurements a day. And we know that hurricanes and tropical storms don't form at the poles, but that's where those crosses are most densely packed. That doesn't really help us. So we're looking at this map and thinking, what is it that we need to do to get better and more accurate forecasts from the satellite data? The answer is, unfortunately, send more satellites up to fill in those gaps. At over a billion dollars a satellite, that's just not feasible. That's where the small satellites come in. And so I'm going to talk more about these CubeSats and where they're from. What we're looking at here is a CubeSat deployer. So back in the year 2000, when most of the rest of us were just relieved to have survived Y2K, there were two professors out in California who were working on how to get student experiments up into space more cheaply and more quickly. The trouble is, in addition to the satellites being very expensive, rockets are also really expensive. Rockets cost about $100 million. As an academic, I can tell you, it's not in the budget. It's really hard to get $100 million. So if you want to get your student experiments up to space to test out some of these great ideas, these innovative thoughts that are coming from the young people coming through the ranks, there's no real way to do that effectively. So these professors are like, how are we going to do this? We, these guys, we try to put the stuff on the rockets. They're not going to let us because they have their billion-dollar satellite in there, and they don't want a student experiment next to it. What if the rocket shakes, something falls off, and hurts the satellite? So they came up with this idea of the CubeSat deployer. For all intents and purposes, it looks a lot like a child's toy, a jack-in-the-box toy. You take the satellite, you push it into the spring-loaded box, you snap the lid down, you turn the crank, the music plays, the satellite, no, no, wait, no, that's not how it goes. <laughs> you put the satellite into the box, you snap the lid closed, you put it into the rocket, and the rocket goes up to space with the little satellite on it in addition to the big satellite. When the rocket gets to the right spot in orbit, the fairing opens, the big satellite comes out, and then the command's given to release the little satellite out there. And so in that way, they created a way for us to get these CubeSats to space, at least little ones. So then we had a way to get new technology into space cheaply. The trouble was we have to fit it in this tiny little box. So for the past 10 years, my team at MIT, in addition to, Professor, to Dr. Bill Blackwell at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, have been working to get this technology down and shrunk into these tiny CubeSats. We've been shrinking the power systems, shrinking the batteries, shrinking the radios and most importantly, shrinking the instruments to get them into these little satellite form factors. So when they deploy, they look something kind of like this. This is an image from the International Space Station. So there are two ways that you can get a CubeSat to orbit. One is up on that rocket and deployed out, and the other is to go up to the space station where they put the deployer on a robotic arm, which is what you see here. And then an astronaut is on board to take the pictures for you, so you get some great images. This is our first satellite. So this is my group's first weather satellite at MIT. It was called Micromass-1, the micro-sized microwave atmospheric satellite. And this is it being deployed on orbit. So the challenge here is getting it right. We had to do it a couple times. Science is hard, engineering is hard sometimes. And so we had to do this a couple times to get everything right. But I'm excited to tell you that this past year, we've finally gotten data from these CubeSats that looks as good as those big weather satellites. Here they are. So these are two CubeSats that have finally gotten data that are as good as weather satellites. 
On your left is the one from MIT that I worked with with Dr. Bill Blackwell at MIT Lincoln Labs. This is Micromass 2A. It's our second try. And on, the, on your right is one called Tempest D. It is the temporal experiment for storm and tropical systems demonstration. And it's from Professor Stephen Rising at Colorado State University in collaboration with NASA JPL. So these two satellites have done it. They have been to orbit in the past year, and they've taken some amazing data that I'm excited to show you. So this next slide is the data from our satellite, Micromace 2A, and that is on your left, compared to the data from the big weather satellite, that NOAA 20 ITMS data on your right. We had to take a little snapshot of the NOAA 20 data in order to compare it with the CubeSat data, but you can see that even though it's not at exactly the same time and same frequency, the data are very similar and is certainly good enough data for a weather forecasting system. So we're really excited about that. We also have a great image of Hurricane Dorian from the Tempest D CubeSat. So what we have here is four different levels in the atmosphere that we've gotten data from. So you know how you're driving along in your car, and you're listening to the radio, and you want to change the station, so you turn the dial in and change the frequency? That's kind of the same way these microwave radiometers work. They have different channels, only on these, each different channel and different frequency sounds a different level in the atmosphere. So this lets us take a 3D image of the hurricanes and tropical storm systems, which is just wonderful data to be able to put into the forecasting models to increase their accuracy. And being able to get it frequently and fill in those gaps is the next challenge. So now that we've done the couple of experimental demonstrations, we need to get more of these on orbit and get them into our weather forecasting system. So that's what we're working on next. Next, we have the NASA Tropics mission. This is, again, with Dr. Bill Blackwell at MIT Lincoln. And we are building six CubeSats this time to go into orbit around the Earth. And we've tried to do a good job of picking the orbits so we get the data where we want it. Here's what they look like. So we've got the six satellites. They're in three different rings around the Earth. There are two satellites on each ring separated halfway apart. And when we unwrap this one, we can see that we're getting data exactly where we want it. And we are filling in those gaps and closing those gaps so that we get more accurate data to run into our models and get better forecasts of hurricanes and tropical storms. <laughs> Very excited. So I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this and to let you know that in the next couple years, as we get this mission on orbit and we get these data into our forecasting models, these hurricane tracks are going to keep coming in closer and closer and closer. We're going to get better data, more accurate data, and you are going to have an even better relationship with your awesome weather forecasters. Thank you.